Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our service tonight here at the Tron Church. It's good to see you, and uh, if you're visiting with us, if it's your first time here, then you're particularly welcome, and we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And uh, we're going to begin our service uh, in just a moment, but perhaps as we do, you'd listen to the Word of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is our faith. This is our hope. And in this hope, we're gathered here this evening. And so we're going to begin by singing a hymn that uh, expresses that great hope. It's number 775 in these blue hymn books. 775, all my hope on God is founded, all my trust he shall renew. 775. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we come before you with gladness and with joy, knowing that you have caused us to be born again into this living hope through Jesus Christ our Lord and through his great resurrection, that our hope is indeed for an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, that is being kept in heaven for us who by God's power are being guarded through faith for this salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. And Lord, even though we have not with our own physical eyes seen our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, yet we love him. And though we don't now see him, we believe in him and we rejoice with joy inexpressible and filled with glory because we are receiving the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We thank you, Lord, for this great hope which is sure and certain because it is founded in God, the one and only living God who made this universe and who created every one of us and who so loved us that he sent his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And so, Father, in the name of this Lord Jesus Christ, we bow this evening with gladness and joy, sure and certain in our hope. And we bring you praise and thanksgiving for the gift of Christ your Son. And our prayer tonight is that everyone here in this building would indeed hear Christ's call, one and all, that every one of us would bow the knee to him, and having done so and pledged our allegiance to him, responding to his great grace, would be indeed kept by his gracious power until his coming, until the revealing of the glory of that is unimaginable, the glory of his heavenly kingdom. So, Lord, as obedient children, help us not to be conformed, not to be squeezed into the mold of this world with its ignorance, but as he who has called us is holy, to be holy likewise in all our conduct. Help us, we pray, to reflect and to radiate the love and the mercy and the compassion of our great Savior, to live for him in proclaiming him to others, and to live for him in showing his goodness and purity and truth and honesty and great love in the way that we live among our friends and our neighbors, our families and our compatriots. Lord, we need you. We need your help. We are so weak upon our own. We're so conscious of our failings. So we draw near to you, Lord, in full assurance of faith, seeking your help, holding you to your promise, asking you to open the door and let the floodgates of your grace and mercy fill our souls once again. So draw near to us, Lord. Open our ears and open our hearts to your words. Strengthen us by your grace and send us on our way to serve the Lord Jesus every day of this coming week. For we ask it for his great glory and for his name's sake. Amen. Well, once again, a warm welcome to all this evening and... Uh, I hope that after the service tonight, you won't have to rush away straight away. There'll be opportunity to uh, speak and to meet one another and encourage one another. There'll be tea and coffee served downstairs uh, and plenty of chance for us to extend our time together. Towards the end of our service this evening, we have uh, two baptisms of friends of ours uh, from China who are here with us, and uh, we're delighted uh, that they're going to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And towards the end of the service... Uh, that will be happening. So it's a night of great joy and great encouragement uh, to all, and uh, we rejoice that you're here uh, to share with us.
Edward Lobb is going to be preaching tonight. He's continuing his studies in the Old Testament in the prophet of Amos. And I'm going to hand over to him shortly to come and read the scriptures to us. But before we do that, let's sing once again. Uh, this time from the screens, you don't need the books. The words should appear. And it's a version uh, of Psalm 42 and 43. As a deer pants for water, so I long for you, Lord. Well, we come now to our reading from the Bible, from the prophet Amos. And if you'd like to follow in our church Bibles, you'll find this on page 767. 767. Amos chapter 5. And I'll read the whole of this chapter this evening. Amos, the prophet, has journeyed from Judah at the call of the Lord to Israel. And 
he has his message from God for the people of Israel. So Amos chapter 5 and verse 1. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, you have built, st built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, and in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas! They shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing those who are skilled in lamentation, and in all vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord! Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sikuth, your king, and Kiyun, your star god, your images that you made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. This is the word of the Lord, and may it be a blessing to us this evening. For well, now, our offering in support of gospel work here and further afield is going to be taken up, and our musicians will play as we have some moments perhaps to think further about Amos chapter 5. <coughs>
Well, let's bow our heads for some moments of prayer now. Let's lift our hearts and our minds to the great, the living, the only true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks, our heartfelt thanks this evening for your many blessings to us. We thank you so much for all who have gathered here this evening to support and to love and to help each other, to listen to your word, to sing your praise, to acknowledge your greatness and the glory and delight of new life in Christ. We think of the prophet Amos all those years ago prophesying that the days would come when the Lord God would send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. And our thanks go to you, dear Father, that your word is open to us and that that famine is not here, at least not here in this place. We thank you so much for our open Bibles and for so many aids and helps that enable us to understand your word more deeply. So our prayer tonight is that you will open our minds and hearts afresh and that you will give us minds and hearts that are ready and obedient and glad and ears that are open to your word, that we might hear it and understand it, be blessed by it and learn more deeply to obey it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn in our hymn books now to number 545. 545. Father of mercies, in your word, what endless glory shines, forever be your name adored in these celestial lines. It's a hymn about the word of God, about the Bible, and a prayer that he should bless us this evening. Number 545.
Well, friends, do let's turn up Amos chapter 5 again, page 767. It's the longest chapter in the book of Amos. And uh, when you first open this chapter, it looks a bit of a muddle. In fact, our English Standard Version, the one that we have uh, in front of us, divides this chapter up into no less than nine paragraphs. And I think the reason why the editors of the ESV do that is because it's genuinely difficult to trace a thread of developing thought through the chapter. The prophet appears to leap from one place to another. There are scenes from a funeral, then a law court, then farming, vineyards, Genesis 1 on creation, music and worship, even the 40 years wandering in the wilderness are mentioned. It seems to be an almost incomprehensible pick and mix of Bible themes. But I think we can begin to make sense of it when we remember the, the situation of Amos himself and what he was doing. The book of Amos, the whole book, is essentially the notes of the sermons that Amos preached in the land of Israel in about 760 BC. And the two Hebrew kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south, were not on friendly terms with each other. Amos came from Judah. The Lord sent him north into the land of Israel. So he was a little bit like a Catholic going into a Protestant part of Belfast at the height of the Troubles. He would have been received with suspicion and hostility. And his sermons, they wouldn't have been like our sermons. I mean, we're so used to the scenario where you have a quiet and friendly congregation listening respectfully to a preacher who preaches for quite a long time. Now, here in our church, if the preacher went on for a whole hour, you would still be listening. You might start to cough a bit and wriggle about, but you'd probably endure it. But Amos, it was a very different situation. Almost certainly he had to preach in the open air. Most of his listeners would have been at least a little bit hostile. And he knew that they were not going to sit down patiently for half an hour and allow him to develop his theme as if he were preaching in the Tron Church at Glasgow. So he had to resort to various preachers' tricks or attention grabbers. We noticed his series of sharp questions in chapter 3. Do two walk together unless they've agreed to meet? Does a lion roar if it hasn't taken its prey? And his gentle mocking of their religious customs and their call to worship that we saw last week in chapter 4. And here in chapter 5, it's as though he knows that he's not likely to hold any of his listeners' attention for more than half a minute. So he fires off a salvo of very short sermons. But the thing that holds these little sermons together is that each one of them is a sharp moment of self-revelation from the Lord. In each of these mini-sermons, we see something of God's features being revealed. Now, of course, the whole Bible is a self-portrait delivered by the Lord to the world. But here in Amos chapter 5, we have a series of very brief but focused moments of self-portraiture. And in a moment, I'd like to bring out five features of the Lord's self-portrait in this chapter. But before I do that, and so as to help us to feel the force of the chapter a bit more, let's remind ourselves of what the people of Israel were like in 760 BC. The short answer is that they were wayward. They were deeply wayward, and they'd been wayward for a long time. Amos arrived in Israel in 760 BC, but the rot had set into Israel about 160 years previously in about 920 BC. That was the year, give or take a year, when Israel and Judah split into two separate kingdoms. The great King Solomon had just died, and his son Rehoboam began his reign in Jerusalem unwisely, threatening to rule the kingdom with a rod of iron. You remember what he said? My father may have ruled you, uh, may, may, may have chastised you with whips, but I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. And the ten tribes who lived in the northern half of the Promised Land told him he could go whistle. They weren't going to be the subjects of a king like that, so they broke away, and they set up Jeroboam I as their first king. And Jeroboam, ungodly but shrewd, very quickly set up shrines for worship at Dan, right up in the north, John O'Groats, you might say, and Bethel, deep in the south. And he made two golden calves, one for Dan and one for Bethel. And he said to the people of Israel, 
these are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. So he cunningly mixed up elements of true Jewish faith, the God who brought you up from Egypt, with blatant pagan idolatry, golden calves. So when Amos arrived, the people of Israel for 160 years had been worshipping these wretched calves, and yet they still spoke of Yahweh, the God of the covenant, as if he were their God, and as if it didn't matter that they'd polluted the true faith of Israel with their pagan idolatry. Now, what was going on in Israel at the time is actually very similar to what goes on a great deal in the Western world today, where you have true faith, real Christian faith, and false faith, which can get mixed up together. Let me give you just one example of this. There's a program that you can hear on Radio 4 every Sunday called Something Understood. Just raise a hand if you ever listen to Something Understood. Yes, there are a few. Not many, I'm not surprised that there aren't many because it comes on at a very unearthly hour, 6.05 a.m. <laughs> and it runs till about 6.30. And then it, if you're a real glutton for punishment, you can switch it on again in the evening at 11.30 p.m. and listen to it all again if you want to. Now, what this program does is to open up a window on the way that religion is thought of in the Western world today. It's a Sunday program. It's about religion. The chief presenter is a man called Sir Mark Tully. And Mark Tully, as you may remember, was for many years the BBC's correspondent in Delhi. He loves India. He knows his India very well. And Mark Tully has a very soothing voice, rather like the voice of a favorite great uncle, as he offers you a slice of homemade cake. Oh, have another slice, Edward. I'm sure you need it, that sort of thing. A reassuring and friendly kind of voice. And every week he chooses or he takes a selected theme. And the themes vary a great deal. Joy, death, marriage, suffering, loss, forgiveness, childhood memories, ponies, all sorts of things come up. And what he does is to develop the theme a little bit. He then illustrates it with musical excerpts and readings of poetry and prose. And then usually he will interview somebody who is thought to be an expert in the theme of the day. He'll interview one week a Hindu teacher, then a Jewish rabbi, a Catholic monk, a professor of English literature, a Muslim academic. But the underlying position of the program is this. Religion, at heart, is a single entity. It's about how to live your life with serenity and joy and understanding. And it manifests itself in a variety of guises. Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Sikhism, even modern pagans who go to Stonehenge for the summer solstice might get a look in occasionally. We can glean shafts of truth from all these different sources. That's the underlying philosophy. Not so the Bible. In the Bible, God says, I am this and not that. I save in this way and not that way. I have sent one Savior, my son Jesus Christ, and there is no way of salvation except through him. In fact, one of the great themes of the Bible, one of the underlying structures of Bible thought is not this, but that. That's the way the Bible teaches truth, negatives and positives. Not this, because this is false, but that which is true. Now, the modern Western attitude to religion hates that kind of thing because it hates to draw lines between truth and falsehood. It wants to say everything is really true in its own way. But the Bible occupies an altogether different landscape. It distinguishes what is true about God and man from what is false about God and man. And in 760 BC, Israel was mixing up real Old Testament faith with pagan idolatry, and God sent Amos to call the Israelites to repent of their folly. God loved them. He loved them, but he didn't love their ways or their mindset, so he sent this courageous prophet to summon them to repentance. So as we look now at chapter 5, we're looking at snippets of self-portraiture which have a very sharp edge to them. God is preaching to the wayward people of Israel. He's appealing to them to return to their senses and he is commanding them to forsake their wicked ways. Now, just one more thing before we drive off down the fairway. These words of Amos are not addressed to us in a direct sense. 
and I guess that's obvious. They were addressed to the people of Israel then, in 760 BC. So, for example, have a look at verse 22. There's a mention there of burnt offerings and grain offerings and fattened animals. Well, obviously, we don't do that, do we? Well, look at verse 26. You and I are not tempted to worship Sikuth or the star god Kiun. But although these words are not addressed to us directly, the God who speaks them is our God, and his character has not changed since 760 BC, and it will never change. So as we look at his self-portrait, we know that we're looking at features of the one true God whom we serve and worship today. The words are not addressed to us, but they are very instructive for us because they teach us about God's unchanging character and ways. As he was then, so he is now. Five things, then, by way of self-portrait. First of all, we see the Lord who mourns. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. Now, in the prophetic books of the Bible, the Lord often pictures himself as the husband of his people. Yes, he is also their shepherd, their king, their judge, their father. And each of these ideas conveys a great truth about the way that he relates to Israel. But there is no picture of him quite so filled with love and longing as the picture of God as the husband of Israel and Israel as his bride. It is a marriage relationship. At least, it should have been. This is why in the New Testament, Jesus is pictured as the heavenly bridegroom and the church as his beloved bride. But here, the marriage has gone disastrously wrong. It's almost as though Israel has jilted him on her way up the aisle, as though the marriage has not really been contracted at all. The Lord here in verse 2 looks out across the promised land and he sees his beautiful, loved fiancée lying on the ground like someone with an incurable wound. And she's forsaken. There's no one to take her lovingly by the hand to lift her up and comfort her. She's what in days gone by would have been called a fallen woman. And what do we see in the face of the Lord? We see tears and weeping and longing and lamentation. Now, of course, God is angry with his people, as Jesus was angry with the many in Israel who rejected him centuries later. But this divine anger is anger expressed in lamentation. Jesus, of course, was just the same. Think of him. He argued with so many Jews and had to condemn so many because of their, their stubborn hardness. But finally, as he approached Jerusalem just before his crucifixion, he mounted the hill overlooking the city, and he saw the city stretched out before him, and he broke down and wept. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, would that you had known the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. It's the same divine heart, fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin Israel. You hear the same note, same note sounded in, in verses 16 and 17. Therefore thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares, the town squares, there shall be wailing. And in all the streets, they shall say, alas, alas. It's like a funeral. They shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing, those who are skilled in lamentation. And in all the vineyards, there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. Pass through your midst, words which echo what God did to the Egyptians on the night of Passover. God will have to judge Israel as he judged the, the Egyptians which is a horrifying thought, but it causes grief to the Lord. And as the Bible molds our hearts and minds to become more like the Lord's heart and mind, we too will learn to mourn over those who stubbornly harden their hearts against the gospel. This message of the Lord molding our thinking to be like his, it came out this morning, if you were here this morning. Alan, who was preaching for us, made the point that God shows no partiality towards Jew and Gentile because the gospel comes to both. And therefore, Peter, the apostle, and we should show no partiality. And it's the same here. Where God is mourning, we too should learn to mourn. So when you're arguing about the gospel with a friend or a relative, 
who's not a Christian, you'll feel frustration and pain, but also sorrow, lamentation, and even more so if you're speaking to somebody who once appeared to follow the Lord but does so no more. The Lord mourns. We too need to learn to mourn. Now secondly, let's look at the Lord who declares himself. And here we're in verses 8 and 9. Just run your eye again over verses 8 and 9. Now what kind of a short sermon would you say verses 8 and 9 are? What would the housewives, the Israelite housewives hurrying to market, have made of verses 8 and 9 if they happened to hear Amos speaking them in a loud voice at the corner of the street? What would the teenagers have thought as they walked along the road practicing how to look cool? Just look at verse, well, that's what teenagers do, isn't it? Look at verse 8. He who made the Pleiades and Orion. Now, most of us, including me, don't know our constellations very well. I guess for two reasons. In this neck of the woods, we don't often see the stars, do we? It tends to be cloudy in this part of the world. But also, there's so much electric light on at nights that we don't see much of the sky, even when the sky is clear. But in Israel, in the 8th century BC, with no light pollution and often not many clouds, people would have known their constellations as well as we know our city streets. And maybe Amos knew what the Israelites were saying about the constellations. Pleiades, Orion, ha, yes, they come up every night just like clockwork, very reliable, never miss. Now says Amos, Israelites, what do you make of the, the daily cycle of the 24 hours? Oh, same thing, Amos, regular as clockwork, sun comes up in the morning, sails across the sky, drops away again. What would you say, Israelites, about clouds? Look here at verse 8, and condensation and the exchange of warmer and colder temperatures and rainfall. How would you account for that in Israel? <laughs> Mr. Prophet, didn't you do that in P6 geography? Water is in the sea, remember? Gets caught up, condensation takes place, it becomes clouds, it moves across the land, drops on your head, we call it rain. No, says Amos, no Israel. You have forgotten the most important element. These things don't just happen, it is the Lord who makes them happen. He made the Pleiades and Orion. It's he who turns darkness into morning and daytime into nighttime. It's he who, by the power of his voice, calls for the waters of the sea and then pours them out as rain. You're observing the creation, but you're forgetting the creator. And I'm going to remind you of him. Look at the end of verse 8. Yahweh is his name. Now, of course, in our modern world, there's an even greater disjunction between the creator and the creation. Some of our brilliant scientists these days, like Professor Hawking, <clears throat> get quite close to the truth as they examine and quantify the dimensions of the universe. And they begin to think, well, perhaps, after all, there may be a unifying power that gives coherence to everything that we can see and measure. But they will fight shy of confessing that there is a creator because to acknowledge God inevitably means bowing before him. And that's what the human heart is so reluctant to do. And so the myth is perpetuated that scientific endeavor and the Bible can never be friends. But it was Albert Einstein who said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. I think what he meant was, you observe and examine and measure you study the physical data carefully. And as you study them, to your amazement, you see just how precisely every me mechanism is tuned. There is a comprehensibility about it. It's quite obviously not simply the product of random physical activity. How then can these things be? The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Now, Amos cuts to the chase by linking the creator with the creation. It is he who made the Pleiades and Orion. The 24-hour cycle of darkness and daylight doesn't just happen. It's the Lord who turns darkness to daylight and vice versa. And the rain doesn't just fall from the sky. It's the Lord who calls for it, and it's the Lord who pours it out. And if verse 8 is making the point that the Lord is the prime mover of the creation, 
verse 9 is making the point that the Lord is the prime mover of human history. Look at verse 9. So when a fortress or a strong city is destroyed by military might, to speak of the cause only in terms of politics and international relations is to miss the reality. It is the Lord who makes destruction flash forth against the strong. Our secular patterns of thought about both science and history, they've moved a long way from the Bible's thinking. Modern man erases, or wants to erase, the decisive element of both science and history from modern thought. But Amos reinstates the decisive element in two brief verses. The Lord is his name. The Lord declares himself as the prime mover of both creation and history. Third, the Lord hates. The Lord hates. Now, I put it rather starkly like that because our thinking can be altogether soft. We often speak about the love of the Lord, and quite rightly, because he loves very greatly, far more greatly than we do and far more deeply than we can understand. As the Apostle John puts it, this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is the greatest love in the world, that the spotless, glorious Son of God should go to the cross and bear there the vile consequences of our sins. But the sins that Jesus took to the cross, those are the sins that God hates. And we can see something of his hatred of Israel's sins in this chapter of Amos. Let's start with verse 21, because it begins with the words, I hate. And you'll see there that the speaker is not Amos, but the Lord himself. 21, I hate I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt off, even though you do the religious things, offer me your burnt and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. It's their empty religious practices that the Lord hates. Now, these, these gatherings were serious corporate gatherings. They're described here in, in verse 21 as feasts and as solemn assemblies. They carried more than a nod towards the law of Moses because they involved burnt offerings and grain offerings and the peace offerings of fattened animals. And all that would be very expensive. It's hard work and it's financially costly to prepare a big animal for a ritual sacrifice. And there was a lot of music, and it was loud music. The noise, in verse 23, he means the din, the cacophony of your songs. Even the melody of the harp was unbearable to him. So Israel was clearly full of active religion and religious meetings. The choirs and the bands were practicing hard. The farmers were feeding up their fat stock. Their assemblies were solemn, as verse 21 puts it. They were ordered and disciplined. There was a sense of gravitas. No doubt they were sincere in their own way. They put a lot of effort into their festivals and their services. But the Lord hated it, despised it. It disgusted him. Why? Look at verse 24. Because they were doing all this religion, but for the other six days of the week, they were neglecting to live by the law of Moses. They were neglecting justice in their law courts and their communities, and they were living as if godliness were supremely unimportant. Now, there's a penetrating message here for the Christian church. It is good for us that we should meet regularly. It's good that we're here, that we meet regularly for praise and prayer and preaching and fellowship. It's lovely. I love coming here myself. It builds us up. It blesses us in all sorts of ways. But if our Sunday worship did not translate into godly living from Monday to Saturday, we would deserve the lash of Amos's tongue. Now, I trust we don't deserve it, but we need to be thoughtful and careful because a church can degenerate into noise and ostentation on a Sunday and godlessness on a Monday. The Lord hates empty religious practice, but he also hates the kind of injustice that Amos is exposing throughout his nine chapters. 
And that's the behavior of hard-hearted, wealthy, powerful people who have power in society and treat poorer people simply as a means to their own greater enrichment. Let's turn back to verse 11 here. You trample on the poor, says the Lord. In other words, you, you, you force the... He goes on to say, you exact or force taxes of grain from him. Verse 12, you afflict the righteous. You take a bribe. You turn aside the needy in the gate. Now that word gate... The city gates were the place where the city elders would meet regularly to hear cases and administer the law. So when you read in the Old Testament of the gates, it really means the law courts. But in these courts of so-called justice in Israel, the needy, the people who came with a good case to plead, are simply being turned aside. And Amos portrays the brutality of these wealthy and powerful people. They won't tolerate anybody questioning their integrity. Look at verse 10. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. In other words, if a city elder still has a sensitive conscience, and he speaks up and gainsays these powerful people, he's quickly shouted down. And he ends up in verse 13. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Amos realizes that there are people around who have been silenced, whistleblowers, you might call them. If they dare to speak out against corrupt practice, they may end up with a dagger between their ribs. So they say nothing. It's a picture of a society that has become brutalized and calloused and full of fear. Truthfulness is strangled. The poor are the ones who suffer greatly, but are powerless to get any redress. And religion, divorced from morality, flourishes and is paraded. When you think of the history of Europe and America in recent centuries, you realize that it's only the gospel that has the power to lift a nation out of this kind of brutality. And conversely, as the gospel recedes from a nation, the old brutalities threaten to reestablish their hold. Thank God for the gospel, therefore. Friends, let us keep preaching it. It's the only hope for us. Nicola Sturgeon, David Cameron... Listen to the gospel and the ethics of the Bible if you want the nation to flourish. God hates empty religion, and he hates injustice and corruption. Now, friends, here's the question for us. Are we prepared to develop hatred in our hearts as well as love? One of God's fundamental commands is that we should be like him. Be holy, he says, because... I am holy. Model your style of life and your, your views upon mine. His holiness involves hatred and love. Love for his people and hatred of sin. Amos is teaching us not only to seek to avoid sin, but to hate sin. It means that the growing Christian learns to hate, to abominate lying and murder and adultery and fraud and injustice. To say, yuck, those are horrible things not simply to avoid these things, but to learn to hate them. The Lord hates. Fourth, the Lord loves. Look again at the self-portrait in verse 15. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. What the Lord loves is the, the idea, the concept of a human society which has justice and righteousness deeply embedded in its DNA. It comes out so memorably in verse 24. Let me read it again. It's such a, a, an important verse. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is Niagara Falls, isn't it? It's not the River Kelvin. This is a society which has been washed and vitalized by a constant flow of the kind of life that brings honor to the Lord and joy and delight to other people. Can you imagine a society where everybody in the society really treats one another as human beings all the time? Now, I'm not saying that we never see this in our modern world. Of course we do, because the image of God, though tarnished, is not erased in our fellow human beings. We see some delightful examples. Let me give you one. 
There's a little snippet of a program that you sometimes get on Radio 2. Yes, I listen to that as well as Radio 4. <clears throat> I think it may be Simon Mayo at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I forget quite, quite where it comes, but it's a little snippet which is called something like thank you. And it shows people expressing their thankfulness for something which has happened in the past. So, for example, a woman will come on and she'll say something like this. It happened way back, 1989. I was driving up the motorway. It was a winter's evening and it was just beginning to snow. And two things happened simultaneously. I had a flat tire and I ran out of petrol. Now, can you believe that those two things could ever happen simultaneously? Well, they did. And it was before the days of mobile phones and I had a bad leg, so I couldn't walk to the next SOS telephone box. So I got out of my car on the hard shoulder and I was in despair. All of a sudden, a man pulled in just in front of me. Having trouble, hen, he said, or words to that effect. You might put it like that, I said. And do you know, he changed my tire. He didn't have any spare fuel in the car, but he had a rope in his car, and he towed me 10 miles up the motorway to the next service station where he bought me tea and a hamburger, and he went on his way, and I never even asked him his name. So if he's out there listening somewhere, I want to say thank you to that man. Now, that kind of story demonstrates human beings behaving like human beings, showing something of the image of God. That man showed mercy and love to a person who was in great need, and the woman showed thankfulness by putting her message out on the radio. Now, in our verse 24, let justice roll down like waters, and in verse 15, hate, evil, love, good, establish justice in the gate, Amos has more in mind than individual people behaving lovingly to each other. He's talking about love and compassion and fairness expressed in judicial procedures. But these things are all of a piece, because when a society loves and honors the Ten Commandments, righteousness will be expressed both on the individual level and on the level of the administration of law. The Lord loves justice, righteousness, and truthfulness. If we too are to love those things, it will sometimes be costly for us. Look again at the man in verse 10, the man who speaks the truth, but is hated for it. He tries to uphold justice in the law courts, but he arouses anger for his pains. But just as we are to learn to hate what the Lord hates, let's also learn to love deeply what the Lord loves. And friends, here is the joy of it. One day, if we're Christian people, we shall be part of a society where justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Remember those great words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. According to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So the glorious new creation is the place where righteousness is at home. It's not very much at home in this world. In this world, righteousness is a shy stranger. She shows her face occasionally, then covers it. But in the new creation, she will be everywhere, and we shall know then what it means to be human. The Lord loves righteousness. Now, fifth and last, the Lord summons the people of Israel, summons people to live. Verse 4, seek me and live. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. Verse 14, seek good and not evil, that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you. Now, historically, Israel collapsed before the Assyrian army only about 40 years after Amos had been preaching there. Samaria, the capital city, was sacked, and all the people were carried far away. In other words, they did not respond to Amos's call to repent. But when Amos was preaching to them, 760 BC, the Lord was still holding out the possibility of repentance and new life for Israel. There was still a window of opportunity. Now let's notice the strange and sad predicament that the Israelites had worked themselves into. They had a false confidence in all their religious activities, as we've seen in verses 21 to 23 but they also had a false confidence in the Lord's willingness to rescue them. 
Look at verses 18 to 20. These Israelites appeared to be wanting the day of the Lord to come. Amos says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Now, for us living in the New Testament era, the day of the Lord means the second coming of the Lord Jesus, who will return to judge the living and the dead, to bring the old world to an end. But in Old Testament times, that phrase, the day of the Lord, meant any significant and powerful visitation of the Lord when he would come to his people by way of dramatic intervention. And the people of Israel in Amos's day were clearly talking a lot. Amos heard it. They were talking a lot about the day of the Lord and how much they wanted the Lord to come to them in some powerful and decisive way. And Amos perceives all too clearly that when the Lord does intervene with Israel, it can only be in judgment and destruction, because for all their talk about him and for all their feasts and their solemn assemblies, they were treating the law of Moses with great contempt. So he says to them, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? In other words, he is saying, you don't know what you're asking for, Israel. When the Lord comes to you, it will be a day of darkness and gloom and terror. And that's exactly what happened some 40 years later. And isn't that a striking picture there in verse 19? As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Can you imagine that? I was once on holiday in the state of Montana in America. I was 18 and I was staying in a rather wild part of the state. And every day I went off for long walks on my own with my binoculars looking for wildlife, including bears. <clears throat> And one day I was going up a hillside trail, I was very far from anywhere and anybody, and I rounded a bend, and there swinging down the, the hillside track towards me was a large black bull. He was moving rapidly. Now friends, you may know that I was never an athlete, but I discovered at that moment previously unknown athletic powers. <laughs> Within about half a minute, I'd shot up a very, very steep wooded hillside, too steep for the bull to climb. And I was just panting at the top and beginning to recover my breath when I looked up. And there in front of me was an enormous bull elk with a pair of antlers like two rocking chairs on his head. And he turned and looked at me. Well, as you can see, I survived. <laughs> he trotted off in the other direction. Now, this verse 19 is intended, genuinely intended, to bring fear into the hearts of Amos's listeners. Amos wants to shock them out of their complacency. He knows that the only day of the Lord they're ever going to experience will be a day of terror, as their cities are destroyed and everything they've worked for will be taken from them. In the words of verse 11, you've built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You've planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. Where then can they turn? Well, there's only one place for them to turn. Verse 4, seek me and live. Verse 6, seek the Lord and live. It's the Lord who gives life. Seek me and live. So let me end tonight by saying to all of us, life is the Lord's gift to us. To seek him, to trust him, and to keep on trusting him is the pathway to life. It is possible for a person to have followed the Lord for some time and then to become disgruntled, unhappy with the Christian life. Perhaps suffering or testing has come your way and you think, I'll turn away from the Lord. But to turn away from the Lord is to turn away from life and to embrace death. Don't do it. Testing and difficulty are part of the authentic Christian life. Let's allow Amos to engrave into our understanding the connection between the Lord and life. There's only one place to turn. Seek the Lord and live, says Amos. Seek me and live, says the Lord. Perhaps you're a person who's come here tonight and you've never turned to the Lord. You've never come to him. Well, do come. 
These words, seek me and live, are more than an invitation. They're a command from heaven. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Don't resist that call from heaven on the ground that you want to keep charge of your own life yourself. You can't keep it. None of us can be shepherd and guide to our own lives. We weren't made to live like that. Seek the Lord, says Amos, and live. Seek me, says the Lord, and live. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray to him. It is you, our dear God and Father, upon whom we depend. It is you who have given us life. And when we were far from you, away in the wilderness, not loving you, not wanting you, it was then that you sent us the Saviour, the one and only. And it was he who so lovingly and at such cost to himself bore the weight of our sinful deserts upon his own shoulders and took the deserved punishment for our sin upon himself and absorbed the anger that we deserved, and yet he took it for us. How gracious you have been, dear Father. We haven't deserved any of this, but we thank you that you've opened up to us through the Lord Jesus Christ the gateway into life everlasting. So we pray that you'll have mercy upon each one of us and give us grace indeed to come to you, to seek you, to go on seeking you and discovering your grace and glory and truth, and through it all, to discover life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's turn now in our hymn book to a hymn number 433, in which we thank the Lord God for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Number 433.
Please sit. <clears throat> well, as I said at the beginning of the service, uh, we come now to a time of baptism. And we're going to uh, baptize two of our good friends here, Faye and Lee, who both come from China. And uh, Faye and Lee, would you like to come and join us at the front here? Lee, where are you? Great. Come up beside me here. Now, I said Faye and Lee are, are both from China. One of the lovely things is that uh, Faye, who comes from southwest China, knew uh, Simon and Joanna when they were working uh, in China. That's where they first uh, met her and had a connection with her. And uh, then, strangely enough, uh, they arrived in Glasgow on exactly the same day, isn't that right? And so Faye had come here to study and uh, was feeling rather homesick and eventually met up with Simon and Joanna again and uh, their friendship and their fellowship has led her uh, to put her faith and her trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that relationship which began all the way in China has come here to full fruition in Glasgow. Isn't that a wonderful thing? And then Lee has also come to Glasgow from China and also likewise has found faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's uh, still studying here and doesn't know yet how long he's going to be in Glasgow. He may be here uh, a little longer, but it may be that he's uh, traveling back to China before too long. But both these, our sister and brother here, wanted to uh, confess their faith publicly and to receive Christian baptism to acknowledge uh, their part and their entrance into the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this is all about. Uh, let me explain, because some here this evening may be friends who have come, uh, particularly for this baptism service, uh, and it may all be a little bit strange to you. So let me uh, explain what this is about. This uh, sacrament, uh, as we call it, this a special sign of baptism was instituted by the Lord Jesus himself after he was raised from the dead and before he ascended to the glory of heaven. And uh, we were hearing this morning about the Great Commission, and sometimes this is one of the places that we call the Great Commission because Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, what Jesus was saying was uh, to fulfill the words of the prophets of old. They had foretold a day, long foretold a day, when one day, through the Messiah, the Christ, God would at last do a new thing on the earth, establishing a new covenant which would be everlasting and which would draw people from every tribe and language and people and nation to belong to the one family of God through Jesus Christ so that they would become part of the true seed of Abraham, those who have faith in the promise of God, part of the true Israel of God, the everlasting family of faith, a people who are cleansed and renewed by the grace of God in the gospel of his Son. Those of you who are hearing this morning, we're hearing all about how God made that so clear to the Apostle Peter, and indeed, in the household of Cornelius that day, there was such a decisive break out of the gospel from the Jewish people to all the people of the earth, for God shows no partiality. And the prophets, I said, had spoken about those days. Ezekiel spoke from God. In that day, he said, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. And I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And so this uh, sacrament, this sign of baptism, is a sign and seal of the fulfillment of God's covenant promises, his grace come to full fruition in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a sign of 
his impartial engrafting into Christ of people from all nations who believe and trust in his Son. It's a sign and a seal of the forgiveness of sins by the sprinkled blood of the Lord Jesus. It's a sign and seal of our regeneration, our remaking and rebirth through the promised pouring out of God's Holy Spirit from heaven upon all flesh, upon all who believe. And it's a sign of our adoption and at last our resurrection, which is our hope, our resurrection to eternal life. And so Christian baptism then testifies to and bears witness to the fulfillment and the completion of all the many ceremonies, all the many washings, all the many sprinklings of the Old Testament times. We were hearing of some of those this evening. Everything that the Old Testament pointed forward to has now been accomplished in the pouring out of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as he sprinkles many nations for their cleansing, as the prophet had said. That's why when we read in the New Testament, in the book of uh, Hebrews, we read this, When Christ appeared, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of bulls or goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls sacrifices, uh, sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will his blood purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that's why Peter says, baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, not just because there's anything special in the water, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. He's not saying baptism is our appeal to God. He's saying Baptism is our appeal to the resurrection of Christ, which is his eternal appeal to God for our everlasting forgiveness. It's that sure and that certain. And that means that baptism preaches to us the pure gospel. It says that all that God promised, he has now fulfilled once and for all in the finished work of Christ. And it's a visible word to remind us that in Christ alone, is our hope found nowhere else. Nothing else is needed. Nothing else is possible. Just the grace of God poured out to us in Jesus Christ. And that's what this sign of the pouring out of water is. The pouring out of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. The pouring out of his Holy Spirit upon those who believe. The pouring out of the mercy of a wonderful Savior. It points us back to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where that blood was shed once for all for the forgiveness of sins. And it points us to a hope that is therefore sure and certain through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so, Fay and Lee have come to be baptized come to profess their faith, which is simply the receiving of the grace of God poured out in the gospel of Christ. They do nothing for their salvation, but they receive it from God in heaven through Jesus, and they receive it in the empty hands of faith. Let me ask you then, both of you, Faye and Lee, Do you confess your faith in God as your heavenly Father and in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? And do you repent of your sins with a humble and contrite heart and put your trust in the mercy of God which is in Jesus Christ alone? Well then, would you kneel?
Lee. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And Faye, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty rest upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Would you stand? Lee, Faye, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And what a thrill it is for all of us to witness your baptism and to rejoice with you in the new life that you'll find in Jesus Christ. So as we stand here together, let's stand as we pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, who promised long ago to Abraham, the father of our faith, that you would bless through him not only his own physical seed, but every family of the earth. How we rejoice that through Jesus Christ our Lord you have declared once and for all and forever the true glory of God upon this earth and his grace and his mercy and his compassion to call people without partiality from every tribe and tongue and language and nation to belong to the household of joy and of faith. And how glad we are to rejoice with our brother and our sister here, rejoicing knowing that not only do we rejoice here in this room tonight, but that as your word tells us, there is rejoicing among the angels in heaven because nothing rejoices the household of our Father more when even one sinner repents and finds life, having turned to the Lord, who is our life. So, Lord, we commit Lee and we commit Faye into your arms and into your heart. We ask that the confession that they have made this night will stay with them to the very end of their lives, that in dark days, when dark days come and when the enemy assaults them, to seek to undermine the assurance of their faith. May they look back to this day and know that the waters of baptism speak to them afresh of your grace and your mercy poured out towards them, not by their works, but by your grace. And will you remind them that, you belong, that they belong and that they are yours forever. So, Lord, Bless and strengthen our dear brother and sister tonight and go with them as they seek to serve you all the days of their lives. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's remain standing as we sing to close this evening our final hymn, number 631, A Confession of Our Belief. Uh, together. We believe in God Almighty, who the heavens and earth has made, Father, who in power created all things hidden and displayed. We believe in one Lord Jesus, God's unique and only Son, God from God, not made, begotten, with the Father truly one. 631.
In a moment, we'll uh, close the form- formal part of our service, but uh, Faye and Lee are going to come back to the front when we finish, and I know that many of you will want to come and greet them and encourage them uh, this evening on this night of their baptism. But uh, as we finish, let's pray together. The Lord Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Lord, help our brother and our sister to be thus faithful, and every one of us here tonight, too, who names the name of Jesus Christ. May we count nothing but loss rather than lose this great salvation. And so, Lord, to that end, would you guard and keep all who are yours and grant us, we pray, entrance into your glorious kingdom of life and into the Father's house of great joy. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.